Oppenheimer. New trendy Christopher Nolan blockbuster this summer. Um, how can I capitalize on this? I know. Lincoln Park. Trust me, there's a good reason for this, okay? The Thousand Sons from 2010 is the fourth full-length album from American rock band Linkin Park, a band that I think a lot of people my age are at least somewhat familiar with, at least with songs like Numb, or In The End. I tried so Well, personally, I am very familiar with these guys. I was absolutely obsessed with them in my mid-teens. And returning to them later as the album connoisseur that I now am, I realized how good of an album A Thousand Suns is. This is a full-blown concept album about nuclear war, of all things. Of course, being all about nuclear bombs, there are tinges of Mr. Oppenheimer sprinkled throughout this entire album. I think even the title itself alludes to this quote. If the radiance of A Thousand Suns were to burst at once into the sky, that would be like the slender of the mighty one. This is the other quote that Oppenheimer took from the Bhagavad Gita, the Hindu scripture. The other one being more famous, of course. I am become deaf. To properly discuss this album, I think it's important to add some background context of where Linkin Park were in their career at the time. So let's back up a bit. <laughs> Through most of their existence, the main setup of the band has been lead vocalist Chester Bennington, rapper and rhythm guitarist Mike Shinoda, lead guitarist Brad Delson, drummer Rob Burden, their turntablist electronics guy Joe Hahn, and their bassist Dave Farrell. This is the general lineup there is for all seven Linkin Park albums that exist to this day, besides their first album where Dave Farrell, their bassist, was not in the band yet. This whole dynamic of course changed with the passing of Chester Bennington in 2017, and the band hasn't released new material ever since. Anyway, their debut, Hyper Theory, gained a massive appeal in the early 2000s. This album contains beloved classics such as In The End, One Step Closer, or even Crawling. <laughs> Hybrid Theory is now certified diamond, having sold 32 million copies worldwide. That's equivalent to going 12 times platinum. On top of this, it is one of the best-selling debut albums of all time, and it is also one of the best-selling rock albums of the 21st century thus far. Hybrid Theory basically established the band's style of new metal with a mix of hip-hop slash rap. A typical Linkin Park album from around this time would consist of Mike rapping on the verses, and then Chester bringing out his beast of a voice to sing on the chorus. They followed their insane same debut up with Meteora in 2003. Meteora more or less continued in the same vein that Hybrid Theory started, and in many ways it's just kind of a Hybrid Theory 2, if you ask me. New Metal has roots in bands such as Korn, and would later on get mainstream appeal in the form of Papa Roach or Limp Bizkit. Hybrid Theory was sort of the peak of New Metal, and in the mid-2000s the whole genre just kind of died. Meteor is still a well-beloved album, though it does have numb and faint on it, but it was playing on a formula that was ultimately going stale. And Linkin Park knew this. Their third album, Minutes to Midnight, was a tone shift and a half for the band. The songs across the board are more introspective, and songs like Leave Out All the Rest or Shadow of the Day are a far cry from the angry metal they once made. Fans were outraged that the band changed up their sound, and I still see people to this day disregard anything the band made after Meteora. I beg to differ though. In fact, I think Minutes to Midnight contains the best song that Linkin Park has ever made. <laughs> Anyway, the style change was pretty much a necessity. If they kept making new metal way past its expiration, they, they would inevitably fade into obscurity. Minutes to Midnight leans more into a milder alt-rock sort of territory. There is however still a nod to their new metal roots with the song Given Up that contains a 17 second long scream from Chester. <laughs> Despite this, the album did still do pretty well going five times platinum. The song What I've Done ended up being one of their biggest songs and even got a place on the soundtrack of the first Transformers movie of all things. It is also important to note that for the production side of things to this album, they employed none other than Rick Rubin. For those of you who don't know, Rick Rubin is this almost mythical being as far as producers go. He has worked with some incredible people, including Beastie Boys, Slayer, Red Hot Chili Peppers, ACDC, Kanye, fucking 
Weezer. Oh yeah, and also he has production credits on every single system of a down record. He says himself that he doesn't really know anything about music and that he's more sort of a guru type character. This man simply has a way of getting the best out of musicians and he has this ability to make them do things that they didn't even know they were capable of. And this leads me pretty smoothly to A Thousand Sons, actually. A Thousand Sons was also created with the help of Rick Rubin, and it shows. This album is in many ways a jab back at people who shit on them for changing their style. There's a good short documentary on YouTube about the creation of this whole album and the whole process, and I'd suggest watching it to whoever's interested. In this, they very much express a need not to conform to anything, really. And thereby, A Thousand Sons is the most challenging work the band has ever done. It's rough around the edges, it's in your face, it's so complete in every aspect. They're not trying to get hits with it, they're making a proper piece of art here. So buckle up for an album about nukes, samples of political speeches, and some peculiar electronic art rock. Let's break this album down. The album opens slowly with two sort of prelude tracks. The Requiem is more or less an ambient track, but featuring some vocoded vocals from Mike Shinoda. The single chorus is a good tone setter for the entire record. It smoothly flows into The Radiance, which features the famous I Am Become Death quote from J. Robert Oppenheimer. We knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. To add some background, this recording of Oppenheimer was broadcast in 1965, 20 years after he and many others witnessed the first detonation of a nuclear bomb. He recalls that he was reminded of two different quotes from the Bhagavad Gita here, both the the radiance of a thousand suns verse, and then also the I am become death verse, which he was then persuaded to say on television. Oppenheimer was very haunted of his own creation. This weapon of mass destruction that he helped make exist. You can hear the deep sadness in his voice as he delivers this verse, and there's just this indescribable expression on his face of the recording as well. It's really an ominous way to begin this whole record, but it makes all the sense if you think about it. Not only the fact that it describes Oppenheimer witnessing the first ever nuclear detonation, but also how it plagued and haunted him afterwards. And I think there's an essence of this notion throughout the entire album. Burning in the Skies consists of an alternating between Mike on the verses and then Chester on the chorus. This thing is chock full of alludes to war and destruction. Already in the first verse, we have cities being ruined and civilians being killed. The chorus in the play on the fact that war is only an act of self sabotage and that if it goes far enough, as in, I don't know, nuclear Armageddon, the world will be destroyed. Chester saying, <laughs> Then alluding to the fact that as a species, we're dumb as hell. And maybe we shouldn't be allowed to destroy our own planet and ourselves like this. Wait. Rock music concept album about Earth being destroyed? This is all sounding painfully familiar. I also like that looking at the surface level, there is also a relationship interpretation you can have here. I mean, burning bridges, losing what I don't deserve. This could clearly be about a breakup or something like that, and I think it's great that this song can do both. I love that. We ended with Empty Space, an 18 second long interlude featuring some stereotypical war sounds, and we also have Brad doing his best Spanish military commander impression. Good job, Brad. Anyway, the start of this album is rather slow, isn't it? How about we kick it up a bit?
When They Come For Me starts with this minute long instrumental intro that's sort of getting you used to the whole beat that's gonna permeate through the entire song. The instrumental starts with this chittering hi-hat and then built on top of that is these gritty and honestly kind of nasty sounding synths. It then adds this hypnotic syncopated drum beat to it and it gives the whole song a very lively rhythm. And later on there are added some more electronic shenanigans to make the whole beat complete. I just love the way it's sort of methodically put together in the intro, like it's this sort of machine being assembled. And I think the machine-like feeling of it ties very well into the theme of this song. I will say this is more or less the only song in this album that doesn't necessarily tie into the overarching concept of it but I think it's a very important song to have on here. This song is a big part of the reason why I even went through the trouble of telling you the entire history of the band up to this point. This song, in its simplest term, is about addressing the haters, pretty much. Mike's lyrics more or less speak for themselves here, so I think it's worth it to dissect it in an almost line-for-line -line fashion, because he's grabbing it a lot here. It is also, in my opinion, some of Mike's best rap verses, so I'm just gonna talk about it because I like it, okay? Mike opens like this. I am not a pattern to be followed The pill that I'm on is a tough one to swallow I'm not a criminal, not a role model Not a born leader, I'm a tough act to follow I am not the fortune and the fame Or the same person telling you to forfeit the game Mike is saying here that Linkin Park is not something to be pinned down and that to fucking stop copying them, I guess. He also uses these sort of gray area bars, as I'm gonna call them. Not a born leaner, but a tough act to follow. Also this first one here, I don't know if it's intentional or not, but both Criminal and Role Model are Eminem songs, both of which talk about pretty much the same thing about don't aspire to me. The last line here refers to the song Points of Authority off of Hybrid Theory, where he does in fact say forfeit the game and, well, He's changed since then. I came in the ring like a dog on a chain and found out the underbelly sicker than it seems and it seems ugly but it can get worse cause even a blueprint is a gift and a curse cause once you got theory of how the thing works everybody wants the next thing to be just like the first. Mike pretty blatantly points out the staleness of the new metal scene here. Especially a blueprint is a gift and a curse I think very obviously refers to Meteora and how it was pretty much a carbon copy of hybrid theory. Especially with the following line also containing the word theory. But hey that's just a theory. A hybrid theory. Thanks for watching. Having made two albums with this blueprint, the fans were conditioned to expect a third one of the same nature, and when the band didn't deliver on that, they did not take kindly to it. He then goes on to this next line, which is great, but is also one of the silliest things I've ever heard this man say. And I'm not a robot, I'm not a monkey, I will not dance even if the beat's funky, opposite of lazy, far from a punk, y'all ought to stop talking, start trying to catch up, motherfucker. I will not dance, even if the beat's funky. That's just hilarious, but also very deep. And see, it's funny here because the beat sounds robotic, and he says he's not a robot, Get it? Jokes aside, Mike is stressing here that he will not let himself be dictated by this blueprint anymore and that he can do whatever the fuck he wants, basically. And instead of conforming, he just tells the haters to fucking deal with it. We then go into the chorus, which repeats the line, try to catch up, motherfucker. As well as these chorus vocals that go, ah, to represent the haters hating. And all the people say, ah. Mike then goes into the next verse with a bunch of references. So yeah, we got Lauren Hill, Notorious, B.I.G., Big Daddy Kane, and Public Enemy he's name dropping here. I imagine he looks up to these people and they are what aspired him to rap, basically. However, Mike is often overlooked as a rapper since, well, he's in a rock band. Mike wants to change that, so it's no wonder that he started his more hip-hop oriented side project Fort Minor around this time as well. He then goes on to, well, show his skills. The flow and delivery of these bars are so well executed, I tell you. It's so short, but it's probably my favorite part of the song. We then get this little breakdown of the instrumental and a bridge with Chester singing. <laughs> We 
towards the ending, the vocals of the chorus are expanded upon and they turn into these almost spiritual sounding vocalizations. You also get a little bit of Brad's Spanish commander impression again, gently reminding us that, hey, this is still the war, El the man. I just realized, it's kind of funny that Mike says he's not a robot here because um, this next song. Robot Boy starts with this deep piano intro, and overall the instrumentation of the song is rather simplistic, only accompanied by some simple percussion and some synths. The strength in this song comes from the ethereal vocal layering instead, not only in the main vocal, but also these harmonious background vocals that just makes the song feel so vast and spacious. <laughs> This song in fact has the highest amount of vocal tracks on any Linkin Park song. The lyrics of Robot Boy deal with apathy, the lack of emotion of any kind. The first two verses describe someone who has been desensitized to feelings of suffering at all due to the amount of hurt they've already withstood. You say you're not gonna fight cause no one will fight for you. the song then turns these lyrics around, pushing for a feeling of hope instead. And with all the vocal layers and Chester's ad-libbing circling around your head when you're wearing headphones, makes for this truly beautiful thing to listen to. This song has a similar dual interpretation as Burning in the Skies had. On the surface, this could be someone who has gone through some sort of personal trauma which has led to depression and is then turned apathetic as his sort of defense mechanism. This song is then a handout to people going through these things and saying that there is still hope out there for them and that they should hold on. Reading it in terms of the concept, we can also see this as someone who has grown apathetic to the seemingly constant stream of death and war that is in our televisions and social media around us now. Seeing humanity destroying itself isn't exactly the most uplifting thing to see. And especially now when information is as ubiquitous as it is, our exposure to the horrors of this world is more than any person should ever have to withstand. Either way, this song goes out to all the fellow robot boys out there. There is still hope for you. The Trinity nuclear test site was located in the Jornada del Muerto desert, which is the namesake of this short interlude. Trinity is where the first ever nuclear bomb was detonated, and the very place that Oppenheimer came about with his Bhagavad Gita quote. The lyrics are simply this repeated phrase in Japanese. <laughs> This translates to lift me up, let me go, which is another line that will become familiar later. Why the Japanese language is showing up in a song named after a nuclear test site, I don't think I need to explain. Waiting for the End is a beautiful, timeless song. It's definitely up there with some of their best work to date. It has such a well-crafted balance to it. It feels lonely but crowded, depressing yet hopeful, quiet and loud. It has everything that I'd ever want in a Linkin Park song. If I had to show someone an example of what a Linkin Park song is after Meteora, this would probably be what I showed them. The song starts with this iconic synth line and then adds these small twinkling piano notes to it. <laughs> The percussion then comes in and it makes for this really, really catchy rhythm. Yeah. 
We start off with a verse of Mike rapping, and this is where the beat mainly shines through. We then go into Chester's first verse. Here the beat is cut down to just the piano, and then there's this droning synth that I hear is almost imitating a violin, and it all makes for this very lonely atmosphere as Chester sings. To understand what Chester's lyrics are getting at here, I think we get the best view from putting all of his verses together. Waiting for the end to come Wishing I had strength to stand This is not what I had planned It's out of my control Flying at the speed of light Thoughts were spinning in my head So many Verses have this feeling of giving up almost. It's like looking at how wrong everything has gone and then just sort of begging for it to be over with. Again, this can easily be interpreted both on the service level and also in the sense of the concept. We can see this Chester, just like in many of the other songs, singing from the perspective of humanity itself, looking at how quickly we evolved from humble animals to destroyers of worlds. There's almost this sense that he'd rather be taken away from this earth than bear to see us destroy it even longer. And I think this makes even more sense when combining it with the chorus. <laughs> Throughout the entirety of Chester's vocals in this song, he sounds so haunting in his delivery and there's this feeling of just deep sadness in his singing. Looking at it through the surface level lens, we can also see this about moving on from a relationship. Throughout the verses too, it sounds like he's had a falling out with someone who he's now desperately trying to hold on to, even though he can't anymore. Towards the last leg of the song, Mike comes back in for a bridge and he spews more words about moving on, and I think mostly this is the essence of the entire song. I think for me at least, this song has sort of been recontextualized in the advent of Chester's suicide, especially the line in the chorus about trading his life for something new. I feel like there's a suicidal reading to that, and the themes of moving on suddenly become about moving on from Chester's own death. A lot of Mike's bridge has also resonated with me in dealing with loss in general. Because Mike is simply right here. Yes, the loss in and of itself is tough, but figuring out how to go on from that point can be just as hard. The song ends with this melding together of Mike's opening verse and Chester's chorus, and it really just becomes this transcending soundscape. Especially the like chopped up vocals of Chester work really great here. Chester's singing here also just transcends to another level and it leads to this just beautiful finish. Blackout is probably one of the most challenging songs Linkin Park has ever made. We've got Chester rapping and Mike singing, everything's just on its head with this one. The song opens with some droning synths, and then on top of this there are these like, almost marching band sounding drums, and there's also this cute keyboard melody that plays on top of it. We then go into Chester's rapping, which works surprisingly well here. I mean, he already sounds kind of aggressive in these verses, and then he smoothly transitions that into his characteristic screaming in the chorus.
After another verse and chorus, we go into this gritty breakdown. A lot of it consists of these chopped up glitchy vocals from Chester. And from the documentary, I saw that this was achieved by Johan mapping some vocal samples of Chester onto a drum pad and then just going nuts with it. <laughs> The last minute and a half of this song is more introspective. We have Mike and Chester singing together and it makes this really cute outro. There's a lot of contrasts in this song. We have Chester screaming over a cute keyboard melody and we have a glitchy bridge followed by this introspective outro. Lyrically, this song seems to be an anger directed at what I presume to be world governments or authority in general. Chester's parts characterize authority as these greedy, untruthful, power-hungry beasts with bloodshot eyes. I feel like then the coma outro is the sort of calm after the storm here. Maybe the bomb went off and the coming down they talk about in the outro is a literal coming down into a bomb shelter. It could also be a coming down emotionally, as in don't let anger conquer you, sort of. On the surface level, this whole song could just be about someone you have a whole lot of anger towards and they've been a real asshole or something like that. Either way, this song is just a feeling of pent-up rage, pretty much. Get down and obey every word. Steady get in mind if you haven't yet heard. Wanna take what I got, don't be absurd. No. Wretches and Kings is another mic centric hip hop track. When They Come For Me Too, Electric Boogaloo, if you will. We open this song with another political speech. This time it is the Bodies Upon the Gear speech by free speech activist Mario Savio. This speech was held at UC Berkeley at a time where political activity on campus had just been banned and, well, this is a protest against that. In the song, we only get the last third of this famous speech, but the last part of it is probably also the most important one. I understand why they cut the rest of it, but I think we can grab some tidbits of information from the rest of it as well. We were told the following. If President Kerr actually tried to get something more liberal out of the regions in his telephone conversations, why didn't he make some public statement to that effect? And the answer we received from a well-meaning liberal was the following. He said, would you ever imagine the manager of a firm making a statement publicly in opposition to his board of directors? That's the answer. Well, I ask you to consider, if this is a firm, and if the board of regents are the board of directors, and if President Kerr in fact is the manager, then I tell you something, the faculty are a bunch of employees, and we're the raw materials. But we're a bunch of raw materials that don't mean to be, have any process upon us, don't mean to be made into any product, don't mean, don't mean to end up being bought by some clients of the university, be they the government, be they industry, be they organized labor, be they anyone, or human being. And then this is the part that is in the song. Now there's a bit more to the quote here, but it's cut off by the beat kicking in. There's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart, that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. This speech, in tandem with the entire song, is about being controlled by authorities. Wretches and Kings, as a song, is ultimately about rising up against this. Just like in When They Come For Me, we have this robotic sounding beat, and I think it ties very well in with Mario Savio saying that we should rise against the machine. Mike's verses are spent on pointing out the injustices in society, and in many ways it ties up with the characterization of governments that Chester made on Blackout just before. This combined with Chester's chorus makes for pretty much just a uprising anthem. the last half of these songs we get these screeching sounding electronics and they sound ugly but in the theme of the song describing authority as these wretched terrible people 
I think the ugliness has its place here. As an outro, we get a reprisal of Mario Savio's speech, this time with the part that was cut off in the beginning with it. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. I come to this magnificent house of worship tonight because my conscience leaves me no other choice. I hope you're not tired of political speeches yet, because we've got another one. This short interlude features an excerpt from the A Time to Break Silence speech by Martin Luther King. I have a dream that one day you'll take a shower. I believe this song has resulted in one of the funniest looking writing credits I've ever seen. Written by Martin Luther King and Linkin Park. Like, yeah, it's true, but it just looks cursed. Anyway, this thing is also known as the uh, Riverside Church speech. First and foremost, it is a anti-Vietnam War speech. Now, this speech in its entirety is an hour long, so the thing that's in the song is only a mere snippet of the entire thing. I come to this magnificent house of worship tonight because my conscience leaves me no other choice. True revolution of values will lay hands on the world order and say of war. This way of settling differences is not just. As the speech goes on, it slowly gets more and more distorted. This business of burning human beings with napalm, filling our nation's homes with orphans and widows, of injecting poisonous drugs of hate into the veins of peoples normally humane. The last phrase gets repeated several times to the point of it sounding almost non-human. Being an anti-war speech and combining it with the voice losing the feeling of humanity, it sort of communicates the loss of humanity in war itself. You were standing in wake of devastation iridescence is a proper ballad it's a song of hope of seeing the light at the end of the tunnel and even though that everything looks dark it's important to still have hope i'll sound like a broken record here but i think again we can look at both the lyrics as a surface level interpretation and in terms of the concept i think especially the chorus was crafted with this in mind do you feel cold This can be the desperation of living through tragedy, but it can also resonate with people who just feel defeated in life. Either way, it tells you to let go of that sadness and move on. Mike's verse leans a little bit more on the concepty side of things. With the burst of light blinding every angel, equating to the radiance of a thousand suns that supposedly came with the detonation of the nuclear bomb. In the ending bridge, the chorus is reprised this time with gang vocals from the entire band, making for this beautiful sense of unity and that to have hope it's important to work together. There's really not much more to talk about here, I think the simplicity and universality in a song about hope just works very well here. Fallout serves as a little prelude to The Catalyst. Fallout features a vocoded version of the chorus that was on Burning in the Skies. Burning 
in the Skies and the Catalyst are sort of tied into each other, mainly through their preludes. The Requiem that started the entire album features a vocoded version of a verse from The Catalyst. I feel like these two songs sort of epitomize the themes of the entire album and being on very opposite ends of it, it also sort of communicates this cyclical nature of war itself. I have the impression that most of this album was sort of built around the catalyst since I feel like it combines a lot of the themes that we find sprinkled throughout the entire album. The funky electronics, the record scratching, the gang vocals, it's all there. I do also believe it was the lead single when the album was rolling out back in 2010. Its position after Iridescent communicates this sort of ever-present cycle of hope followed by hopelessness followed by hope followed by hopelessness just forever. The verses here even beckon God for mercy and there's this whole like fear of atomic war that's going on. It can't be out The second half of the chorus I find sort of interesting. Every radio transmission that we've ever sent is indeterminately flowing through space right now. And I think this sort of ties into the three political speeches that have been sampled throughout this album. These three speeches all sort of detail tragedies of humanity and it sort of reminds me of a fact that I heard a while ago. One of the earliest radio broadcasts that were strong enough to escape out into space was probably that of Nazi propaganda. And it's wild to think that if there is alien life out there that can receive radio waves the first words of humanity they might hear could be those of Adolf Hitler. It's depressing, really. Anyway, about halfway through the song, we get this friggin' keyboard solo and it's friggin' slapping, dude. We then go into the bridge with Mike and Chester repeating the phrase. The same sentence that was being said in Japanese back on Honor del Muerto. I believe this mantra is sort of a begging to be taken away from this earth, away from the chaos and suffering. And well, looking back at Honor del Muerto, this kind of mirrors the Japanese people that were taken away from this earth after the atom bombings. I think it ties into Waiting for the End as well, with Chester singing about trading his life for something new. It's a phrase I believe permeates through the very fiber of this entire album. It's, it's a yearning to just make it all go away. The Messenger is a nice, quiet send-off. Gone are the electronics and vocoders, and we are left with Chester, an acoustic guitar, and a piano. And that's it. It's a nice ending note with a feeling of hope yet again. A message that, despite all the suffering, there is one universal emotion that can tie us all together, and that is love. Remember your love, and you always will be. This melody This song has made me cry on several occasions. We're in the end game now, Tinky Winky. The Thousand Suns is a thoroughly crafted conceptual masterpiece, if you ask me at least. It's an album that I feel like ultimately gets overlooked by many. I have recently seen it finally get some attention and 
recognition on YouTube, but I feel like it hasn't been broken down in a way that does the art justice. And that's why I made this video. Thousand Sons is a very unique piece of art, and I feel like there won't ever be anything similar to it. It's not that fear of nuclear war or war in general hasn't been done before in an album, it definitely has, but it's the whole package combined that makes it so special. You could argue that I'm blinded by nostalgia here, but if that's the case, so be it. I love this album, I am passionate about it, and you can't say nothing about that. And besides the art itself, I believe the context of the band itself around this time makes it stand out even more. It's a turning point right in the middle of their discography. Linkin Park would go on to make another album in this sort of electronic space with Living Things, which is another album that I also hold dear. The sixth album, The Hunting Party, would see them do a similar fuck you to people that hate on them for changing their sound. And then their latest album, One More Light, sees them going in and One More Light was released just two months before the passing of Chester Bennington and may he rest in peace. I don't think there's a single celebrity death that has affected me in quite the same way as Chester did. And I'm glad to still be admiring his legacy to this day. And I think that was it for this video. Thank you for watching. This has been a real passion project of mine. So if you liked it, that's great. And if you didn't, well... I don't mind. I had so much fun making this thing. But yeah, that's all I have. So um, see you next time, folks. Uh, love ya.